This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Shortly after celebrating his 61st birthday, in March 1958, Lefty O'Doul invited a friend of his, sports writer Harry Brundage, for a stroll along the streets of San Francisco. O'Doul was, as always, in excellent spirits and chattered incessantly. He was excited that his old team, the New York Giants, had pulled up stakes and was about to open the new baseball season in his hometown. Recently retired after 40 years in professional baseball, the two-time National League batting champion, legendary hitting instructor, and successful minor league manager would soon be opening a restaurant on Geary Street, bearing his name, around the corner from a pub he had owned in the 1940s. As the two men strode through historic Union Square, Brundage noted O'Doul's always impeccable appearance. This day, his sartorial selection, featuring an alpine hat with a feather and a herringbone jacket, and marveled at his friend's countenance, which made him appear twenty years younger than he had the right to. O'Doul was on a first-name basis, with world-famous athletes, movie stars, and politicians, and the city seemed to belong to him. San Francisco Examiner columnist Charles Einstein famously wrote about O'Doul's habit of riding in the front seat of taxis and steering the driver to destinations based on route instructions that were always the most direct, if not always the most legal. In those circumstances, police would invariably halt the vehicle until spotting O'Doul, at which point an officer would smile and wave the driver on his way. It appeared to Brundage that the city was devoid of strangers. O'Doul recognized everyone crossing his path, and they him, as he greeted each person by name and spoke softly in rapid, staccato half-sentences, punctuating their delivery with animated facial expressions. Brundage began to understand why San Francisco Seal's owner, Charlie Graham, had dreaded walking down the street with Lefty O'Doul. It wasn't a walk so much as a never-ending series of interruptions. O'Doul had an easy air about him, a generous spirit that shone through. People were genuinely glad to see him. Brundage thought to himself that the best word to describe his friend was dynamic. During their stroll, O'Doul and Brundage were suddenly hailed by a group of Japanese businessmen who removed their hats and bowed. O'Doul-san shouted one of the men, clearly delighted at encountering the baseball star. Konnichiwa. O'Doul bowed in turn and was introduced to the man's associates. They shook hands and continued to exchange pleasantries in Japanese. Before parting, the man who had first greeted O'Doul turned to Brundage and, after apologizing for his rudeness and not addressing him earlier, told the reporter, "In Japan, O'Doul-san is great national hero. O'Doul is number one in Nipponese hearts. Great hero. O'Doul, most admired American, including the illustrious MacArthur-san." Lefty O'Doul had visited Japan more than a dozen times as a player and ambassador for the game, including momentous trips in 1931 and 1934. The latter headlined by Babe Ruth, and in 1949, when he was asked to help repair U.S.-Japanese relations with a baseball tour, Brundage remembered arriving in Tokyo in 1945, shortly after the surrender of Japan, and being peppered with questions from Japanese citizens, including Emperor Hirohito's brother, wanting to know about Lefty O'Doul. Prince Fumimaro Kono, who twice served as Japanese Prime Minister, told Brundage that O'Doul should have been a diplomat rather than a ball player. Pleasantries concluded. The Japanese businessmen continued on their way, as did O'Doul and Brundage. While they walked, Brundage remained struck by the adulation accorded O'Doul in his hometown by men who had traveled several thousand miles and recognized him during a chance meeting on the street.